first of all, I want to mention that I won't be using the word barcoding in my talk at all, so sorry about that. Um, and, and second, I will be talking a lot, like William did before lunch, about the, d the, the interplay between forest and savanna, but I'll be doing it from a reptile's point of view. So as you're certainly well aware by now, Africa is a continent of huge habitat diversity, all the way from tropical rainforest straight through to true desert. And this diversity would have played a role in the diversity of uh, generating the diversity of reptiles on the continent. In fact, uh, more than 15% of the world's reptiles are in Africa and if on the continent. And if we include the island of Madagascar, it's up to 20%. But to understand how this diversity was created, we actually have to look deep, deep into the past to a time when Africa was part of the southern supercontinent Gondwana. And this was at, at the end of the Triassic about 200 million years ago. So what were squamate reptiles doing at the time? And I say squamate reptiles because I'm going to be talking about just the squamates, which is all the reptiles excluding birds, dinosaurs, crocs, and tortoises. So squamate reptiles, this was a time when they diverged from each other forming the main groups that we have today. And because Africa was part of the supercontinent at the time, and this was the main diversification okay. event, we expect, or in fact we know, that all the main squamate groups are represented on Africa. But after that time, Gondwana broke into bits, as you know, and this was about 120 million years ago. Africa became isolated from the rest of the southern continents, in fact, all of the continents. And it's been in isolation most of the last 120 million years ago. Only recently, as William mentioned, did it hit up into Eurasia. So what was happening now with our squamate reptiles at that time? If you have a look here at about 120 million years ago, this was when the major radiations within the squamate group started. So that means that any of the radiations within these groups that are in Africa at the time would have been in isolation. So what we can expect is that if this vicariant event played a role in the diversification of reptiles, we would expect that these groups on Africa would have mid-Cretaceous origins about 120 million years ago, because that's when Africa became isolated, that they would be endemic clades to Africa, so they would radiate, radiate in isolation, and that, of course, they'd then be phylogenetically clustered. So to have a look at this, we're going to look at the chameleons. So th using that same dated phylogeny, you can see here I've broken it out a bit differently now. Chameleons here are related to their agamid these are agamid lizards, they're the sister group to chameleons, and they split from agamid lizards at about 120 million years ago. Chameleons are African. Agamid lizards are Asian and Australian primarily. So it suggests that the vicariance event, the isolation of Africa, had something to do with this split here. That we, because Africa became isolated, chameleons split from their relatives and became chameleons. So if we check back into that, um, that sort of model that I set up, we see that chameleons have a mid-Cretaceous divergence from agamids. They're 98% endemic to Africa. There's a couple of species that are in Europe and Asia, but there are recent dispersals there. So they do, they're endemic, and they are, of course, phylogenetically clustered. So we think that the vicariants of Africa got things going for chameleons. But what happened since that time now we move into the Cenozoic. And in the Cenozoic, so this is a, a, it's a temperature proxy over the Cenozoic. So I'm going to call it a climate record. And this is, you can think of this as a temperature axis with high temperatures here and low temperatures here. And this is millions of years. Okay, and the Cenozoic starts about here, end of Cretaceous. So what's pretty obvious here is that early on, start of the Cenozoic, it was much warmer. And Throughout the Cenozoic, we have this cooling trend over time, long cooling trend. Lots of variation within it, but there's a huge difference between the Cenozoic and now, the early Cenozoic and now. So at the start of the Cenozoic, we have what is typically called greenhouse earth conditions. And then through about the mid-Eocene here, we switch into icehouse earth conditions. 
this would have a huge impact on the global patterns of, well, of everything really. Um, and if we look at Africa, it's thought that initially, under the Cretaceous start of the Cenozoic, Africa was covered in forest. Okay, I'm just, I'm generalizing, but in general, yeah, covered in forest, okay? Now this is a model that shows the forest extent throughout the Cenozoic. It's a model, but it, it, it does show that initially, this is area here, a forest, and this is millions of years again, and this is that same climate record. Okay, so initially, start of the Cenozoic, we have lots of forest in Africa, and throughout the Cenozoic, it drops substantially until the last 10 million years, where it really drops off in extent. This is William's 10 million year mark, where um, he, get, he talked about the rise of savanna in the last 10 million years. It's also reflected in the demise of the forest. So, as forest is decreasing in extent, it would be contracting and fragmenting, but that means that something else has to take its place. Other biomes have to arise on the continent. New habitats have to arise. Now, uh, we're talking about chameleons, though, aren't we? So in, in Africa, we would have the, these other biomes coming up. Here's forest. Here's um, these little green patches here, forest. So it's primary in the tr uh, primarily in the tropical belt and primarily in little bits in East and Southern Africa and then these other biomes rising up. Chameleons are forest specialists, so if forest is disappearing out from under them, what are they doing? Are they just going extinct, or are they changing and using these other habitats? Okay, so this is a dated phylogeny of chameleons, and the uh, triangles show the different genera. Now we wanna ask whether or not the fragmentation and contraction of forest has significantly impacted the diversification of chameleons. So, here's the forest and the climate record. Like William, I don't believe that it's just climate involved here. There's other things going on. That's why I wanna show you each time the forest and the climate record. Okay, so that's where they kind of match up with the dates on the phylogeny. And what you should have a look at here is in uh, bright green. This is where the generic level diversification events are and they are essentially in the Eocene. I mentioned earlier that the Eocene was the start of the initiation of the deterioration, if you want to call it, of climate, the, the drop in temperatures and the beginning of the loss of forest. So it's kind of um, coincidental, perhaps, that the diverse main diversification of chameleons starts at the same time when the forests begin to fragment. They're forest specialists, so this could have been allopatric diversification. Okay, but let's actually have a look at what was happening before the mid-Eocene as well. So I mentioned that we think we had this pan-African forest for chameleons that would have been really nice. They like it, they would have been everywhere, presumably, and this would have provided a stable environment for them that was very cohesive, so they could kind of get across the landscape easily. There was not lots of barriers, presumably, in place that would cause them to diversify. So we would have low net diversification early on in the, in the chameleon history, and if you look at the tree, of course, there are very few lineages before that time. Okay, extinctions aside, because we can't really track that in the phylogeny, we have low net diversification. Okay, but, and then we have the period of time when we have the um, fragmentation of the forests occurring, and then we get our increase in net diversification. We can actually see this in the lineage through time plot here. So this is, oops, you, sorry, I need to go back, backwards, there we go. The lineage through time plot, so this is the, the climate record again. This is number of lineages, and this is years, or millions of years. The red shows the expected number of lineages through time, and that thin black line shows the observed number of lineages through time. So we don't get, we, ha we actually have fewer lineages than expected early on here. Up until about 45 million years ago, we have few lineages. We only get the expected number at this period of time here, the Eocene, when we get our forests decreasing. So fragmentation of forests is probably what uh, the second thing that gets chameleons going. Gets first we had the isolation of Africa, now we have them 
therefore it's fragmenting and they start to diversify. Okay, but then what happens next? We have our ice house earth conditions. So that's from about the mid Eocene till now. <laughs> and during that time, as I mentioned, we have these novel habitats arising on the continent. And this could have provided an opportunity for ecological diversification for, for chameleons. Okay, so what I have here, so, oh yes, and I should mention that I, I did say earlier chameleons are forest specialists. They're not really. They live in, some chameleons live outside of forest. They do live in savanna and fainbos and grasslands and things like that. But not all do, but some. So what's going on here? So what I did was I coded the tips here for every uh, all the biomes where the chameleons occur, where each species occurs. And then I did an ancestral character state reconstruction and I'm coding, uh, color coding the branches there according to the most likely character state, okay? So what you'll see first of all is that some genera stay in forest. Well, first of all, forest is the ancestral um, habitat for chameleons, but that makes sense. And then some, some genera stay in forest. They don't leave it. They haven't diversified outside of forest. And there, where forest is fragmenting all through time, they're still diversifying, but it's allopatric. Okay, we have other genera, though, that have gone into these other habitats. But they've only done so in the last, let's say, 20-ish million years when these other habitats supposedly have become more prevalent on the landscape. Not just savanna, but other things, and maybe even C3 type savanna types that may have been even earlier than the C4 savannas. So it does seem that the diversification has, was initiated by getting into these other biomes. Okay, but how do we prove that if we can? So what we did was we took one genus, Bradypodian, and this is the dated phylogeny for Bradypodian, and I've colored uh, each of the branches in terms of whether the species is in forest or is in another habitat. In this case, it's heathlands and grasslands. And there are three sister pairs that we looked at. One was in forest and the other was in another habitat. And we had a look at ecological opportunity. So you're a chameleon. What would be ecologically important for you? They live in a very structured, three-dimensional habitat with lots of places to go. And chameleons, as you know, have those gripping hands. So they need to grab the perches or the branches where they're going and they need to do it so they're never dislodged. They get beat up by other chameleons, they get attacked by predators. These things can dislodge them. They also need to be very still and stable when they are predators themselves. So gripping, we think, is a really important ecologically relevant trait for chameleons. So we measured grip strength for these three sister pairs. We did this by presenting the chameleons a perch, a branch to grab, and we measured the force at which they're grabbing using this force plate here. So, okay, so I'm gonna show you the gripping stuff, but first, the, th the sister pairs. I wanna tell you a little bit about them. So we have a forest chameleon and a other kind of chameleon. The forest chameleons are large, they are brightly colored, they have ornamentation on their head and here, and um, they're using very large perches. We know that because we measured the perches that they're on. And they um, are, oh yeah, they use perches of all different angles, so they don't seem to care what kind of perch, but it has to be large. Then in this case, it's a Feinbos chameleon, and these other chameleons, they have small bodies, they're drab in color, they don't have ornamentation, and they use small perches. We've measured those perches as well, so we know that. They also use vertical perches. They don't use perches of all angles, only the vertical ones, despite the picture. <laughs> um, okay, so now the gripping. So this is a, a regression showing the size corrected. So it's size corrected, this is size, and this is grip strength, and the colors match this way, okay? So for any given size, the Feinbos chameleon has a, a weak and ineffective grip compared to the forest chameleon on a branch that matches the forest environment, so it's a thick branch. So it suggests that the Feinbos chameleon 
is not well adapted to the forest environment. All the perches that are in the forest are large. So it doesn't utilize the forest environment very well, whereas the forest chameleon does. So it seems as though there's ecological specialization in forest and in fynbos, and that chameleons that are moving into these new habitats are ecologically diversifying. They're adapting to these new conditions. Um, we also had a look at CT scans for the uh, pans, and this is uh, just showing you a comparison side by side of the forest and the non-forest chameleons and the structure of the bones in the pans, this is the side view and the top view, so the wrist from the top, are fundamentally different as well in terms of their proportions and which bones are uh, fused and not or not. So again, suggesting that grabbing the perch in the fane boss is a really different thing than grabbing a perch in a forest and that it's translated into their skeletal structure as well. Okay, so we have the other two comparisons that I mentioned, just very briefly. We have a fane boss, sorry, a fane boss and a forest chameleon, and we get the same thing. For any given size, the forest chameleon is better at gripping the forest perch that's large. And again, the last comparison, this is uh, forest and a grassland chameleon this time. And again, the same relationship. It's even though it's weaker, I admit, it was significantly different. So it does seem to have something going on here. The last thing we looked at for these chameleons was limb kinematics. So we presented, uh, we only did this for one sister comparison, and we gave the two species um, perches to walk on, and we digitized them using high-speed video. And then we took the limb kinematic variables off the video, and we put them into a discriminant function analysis, analysis to see if they walk differently. And we did this on vertical perches, on horizontal perches, on thin perches, and, and on thick perches. And I'm just going to show you the one, vertical perches, narrow and wide. So the crosses are wide, and the circles are narrow perches, and then color coding, OK? What you should see, or what I want you to see, <laughs> is that the Feinboss morph in this example walks in a fundamentally different way when it's on a vertical narrow perch than it does when it's on a thick perch. Vertical narrow perches are what its environment is. It's what it is grabbing when it's out in the environment. So when it's in its own sort of home territory, it's walking very differently than it is when it's on a fat perch. Also, the forest chameleon walks very differently than this chameleon on a vertical perch. So, not only is the walking different, these, got these ways of walking here are very clumsy. So when the chameleon's presented a vertical perch, this guy, he's clumsy on it. That's vertical perches aren't in his environment. This guy is great on the vertical narrow perch. Again, pushing that <laughs> sort of message that they're adapting to their different environment, the new environments that have come up on the landscape. OK, I'm going to switch from chameleons now to a much shorter example, but similar. And this is from vipers. So vipers are all over the world. And there's, there's, a, but these, there's also a group of vipers that are old world only. So they're in Africa, Asia, and um, Europe. And if you have a look at the dates here of the old world vipers, they're young. They're 35-ish million years. So the vicariants of Africa that I talked about initially isn't going to play a role here in the diversification of the vipers, the, vi the subfamily that's the old world vipers. Um, but there are some other parallels we can draw with the vipers, with the chameleons. But we're going to do it much later in time than we did with the chameleons, and this is in the Miocene. So this is, only, this is the genus we're going to look at. It's Bitis. They're sub-Saharan African primarily, and they're an iconic African genus of snakes. Everyone in Africa knows this genus because it contains the puff adder, which everyone knows. So... Um, very prevalent on the landscape. And what I have here is the dated phylogeny for the genus, so species level phylogeny. And the first thing I want to show you is that climate record again and the forest extent record. Have a look at where most of the diversification in the genus is. The last 10 million years, again, with the rise of savanna and the demise of forest, 
that's when these guys begin to diversify steadily, heavily. Before that time, there's not much going on. So like the chameleons, where they had this period of stability, even though it was millions of years before this, they had their period of stability, there was lots of forest, landscape was cohesive. With the vipers, with the bitis, bitis vipers, it seems as though they have their period of stability too, but it's in the early Miocene, late Oligocene, when probably not a lot was happening in terms of changes in either extent of forest or loss of forest and rise of savanna, and not a lot was happening climatically either. Okay, so what I wanted to do here was have a look at reconstructing ancestral climate for these guys. So I projected uh, coordinates of all the records we have of all of these species on this aridity layer. And then I took the values out from the aridity layer under each of these data points and I made an average value for each species. So an aridity value going from hyperarid all the way through to humic and I color coded everything according to this scale here. So these would be arid and these would be humic from sort of white to red. And I've also used the size of the circles as an indicator of the um, aridity. Okay. And then looking at the ancestral reconstruction, so on the nodes is a little circle that shows this same scale here. If you look all the way back to the Oligocene at the mm, beginning of this genus, you'll see that we have a m sort of a middle ar arid environment. It's mesic, it's not hyperarid, and it's not humic either something in between, but that matches very well again with there's not much, it, we've finished with the Cretaceous now. Things are not tropical and, and warm and anymore, and we haven't got up to where we are now with things on the continent are extremely arid. So we're somewhere in between 25 million years ago, and it does seem that the ancestral climate for these guys matches that. If we look over, um, through time now, so and go up here to this clade here. This is a group of large bodied forest vipers. So this guy here, if you know about the gaboon adder, for example, that's what these guys are. They're huge snakes and they live on the forest floor. Forest again. So they're only in forest. They're in this central belt and in some of these forests in the east and south. And have a look at when they start to diversify. These are forest species. They start to diversify when that forest starts to finally enter its final demise. So as forest continues to fragment and get into little patches, it could be the thing that initiates the diversification of these species here. The opposite now is to have a look at this group here. This is an arid, hyper-arid living group. It moved into hyper-arid environments about five million years ago, and then it diversified. When did these hyperarid environments come up? Certainly less than 10 million years ago. So these are things that are over here in the southwest. This is an area where the Namib Desert is, where the Great Karoo is, where the succulent Karoo, and the dune systems in the west coast. Extremely arid environments, and they're all very new. We even think Karoo is probably, for example, younger than five million years. So as these hyperarid environments came up, one clade, got into them and diversified. So the hyperarid regions probably gave them, like chameleons, ecological opportunity to get into something new, even though it's a different time period and a different um, habitat than chameleons. And then the last thing is that I had a look at vegetation type using NDVI. That's the vegetation index that they get with the satellite. And I took, it, uh, took the layer again, and I projected the co uh, coordinates, and I got an, N an NDVI value for each species, going from occurring in barren environments to forested environments. And then I did the ancestral reconstruction on that as well. And going back in time, the ancestral NDVI, so vegetation type, would have been something, surprise, surprise, in between, it wasn't barren and it wasn't forested. So this is a time forests are decreasing. We have some other environments and the landscape. I said that the bitis occurred in ancestrally in sort of a mesic environment, not only mesic, but kind of an in-between vegetation type, maybe a 
kind of savanna type thing. It's not um, gone one way or the other yet. Only later in time, at again, about 10 million years, we get our fragmentation of forests, that last fragmentation when these guys um, diversify. And this is similar to the, the humic thing. So it's just a repeat in pattern on the humic thing that I showed you on the previous slide. But also here in the arid living clade, again, getting into really barren, barren environments at about five million years ago. Maybe kind of a switch to almost barren at this point, but really getting into these barren areas at five million years. The, the coding there is, the, the circle is so small you can't even see it. That's how barren the, the places are. So, okay, just to kind of summarize then, I've gone through a couple of different themes and applied them to these two different groups. So we have our period of stability for both, low diversification happening, not much going on, but there's not much going on in the, in the biomes either at those periods, at least as far as that reptile is concerned. It's, it doesn't see much change on the landscape and there's not much diversification. Then we have our, our instances where there's allopatric diversification happening because of fragmentation in forest in both cases. And then finally we have in both cases certain groups going into novel habitats and specializing them. And at least for chameleons we can show that there's some ecological adaptation there. We haven't shown it yet for the snakes. We're hoping to do that next by having a look at what's ecologically relevant for them like we did with the chameleons, but it does seem as though they're highly specialized types of snakes that are in these barren environments. So we do see the repeated sort of themes here. I'm not suggesting that this works for every group. Certainly what happens to species is idiosyncratic. So it can be just completely dependent and it can be random processes going on there too. And looking back like this, we're kind of looking at it in a de deterministic way, but it's not really deterministic if you're 60 million years ago and looking forward. You don't know what's going to happen. And that's what's actually kind of fun about this, is trying to come up with a reason for these things and, and explain them and see if it holds for different groups, even if it's in different time periods and in different habitats. So that's what I have um, got. And I want to, while I'm here, thank Michelle and her team, because it's been fantastic that to have invited us all here. and I'm. I'm really pleased to be here to tell you about chameleons and snakes. And we saw a black mamba last night on the drive. So maybe tonight, when, or whenever we're go, going out, I don't know. We can hope. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Christoph. Um, are there any questions? Oh, lots of questions. <laughs> I have two questions uh, connected to your talk. And first of all, thank you for your nice presentation and real scientific uh, job you do. And uh, the question is uh, how these uh, beautiful trees were reconstructed? What technique was used to build your trees? That is the first question. Okay. And the second question is connected all your uh, reconstruction were connected with the temperature uh, curve. And uh, I don't understand exactly what the data based on the, this curve. Temperature. Okay, so we, we for recon I didn't talk any methods because <laughs> um, I think it, yeah, it's not that interesting. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we used BEAST and we did fossil calibrations on both of the phylogenies. Actually, the big phylogeny of all squamates is, isn't mine. It's um, uh, John Weems and his uh, colleagues. And the other question was, um, oh, the climate record. That's also from uh, Zakos 2000 and anybody know? 2007 or something. So I downloaded their data and I just put it in Excel. Okay. So that's their data. I can't, s they used temp they used cores in the- uh, I mean, what uh, the database CO, CO, or oxygen consumption, some 18 oxygen, or what data on the temperature records? 
So, so through, through time. That's from another publication. That's not mine. I, I see. I yeah. see. But and it's what a is delta it? um, ox oxygen isotope something that that emulates t that is a proxy for temperature. So it's that delta oxygen signature that's in cores, and I think they were oceanic cores, if I remember from the paper. My question is uh, about the temperature curve. Is uh, but a little bit contradictive with the current view of the uh, increase of the temperature. Your curve shows that the temperature is decreased yes. to the modern date, oh, but conven convenient um, current view on this that the temperature is increased. Oh, in the in last the current fi 50 <laughs> years, yeah, but that's not in that graph, because that graph is for 60 million years, so it wouldn't show what's happening in the last 50 years. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, you have shown that most of the diversification was caused by abiotic factors, but when you have fragmentation, you, you could also have an increase or a decrease in the prey or the predators that were directly related to your species of interest. How did you disentangle these biotic effects? No, we can't, not, not in these sorts of analyses. So we don't even know what the biotic factors were 60 million years ago for chameleons, we can as or snakes for that matter. We can assume that things are similar to they are now. So we have to make certain assumptions in order to, and very big generalizations, I admit, to coming up with um, these inferences about what's going on. So, yeah, we can't put the biotic factors in here. Yeah, but yeah. what are the prey or the predators of your species? Chameleons eat snakes. Uh, no, the other way around. Snakes eat chameleons. Yeah. <laughs> so you could um, do the diversification or, or analysis for both and see if we give the same so pattern. So I have some ideas around that, but I'm not going to announce it publicly because uh, it's still ideas, but I have exactly some things to think about with that that has been churning around for a while. Yeah. 